Welcome to In Touch. I'm Lucy Sondel. My guest today is David Rodich, and we've promised to finish up with the look at churches in Wadsworth, the historical aspect of it, and cover a couple more things that are pertinent in the month of May. Welcome, David. Thank you. Well, we have about 30 different congregations that currently worship in the city of Wadsworth and the adjoining areas, and we don't have enough time to go through each and every one of them. Although but we tried. <laughs> we tried to. But there are a few other things that we should touch upon. Um, we looked at this photograph the last time we were together. It's a picture of the Trinity Evangelical and Reformed Church on High Street, which was built in 1912. The congregation was founded in 1858. And when they were celebrating one of their anniversaries in 1930, they brought together all of their former pastors, as is often done in a, a church. They bring together all the living pastors, and uh, they sat for a photograph. Okay. There it is. Now you could pretty well identify this as Trinity Church, of course, with the bricks and the window. But in the front row, you have the Reverend Royer, who was a pastor in the 1800s, just, at the, just after the uh, 1800s, I should say. And Harriet Goss, who was the widow of Dr. Sebastian Goss, who was the veteran pastor of the church until his retirement in 1900 to accept the chancellorship of Heidelberg College. And uh, he died about a year afterwards. And the Reverend Beam uh, in the front row. And in the back is the Reverend E. E. Ezekiel, who for many years was a prominent uh, person in Wadsworth, not only because he was pastor of the Trinity Church, but also was a member of the Board of Education. And in the center is the Reverend Gebhardt, who was pastor at the time that this photograph was taken. And on the right-hand side is the Reverend G.T.N. Beam, who you might recall we saw in the photograph of the church under construction in 1912. And he was a brother of the Reverend Beam, who was in the front row. Okay. Now, the Grace Lutheran Church... Uh, I misspoke in identifying a photograph the last time we were together. I referred to it as the Grace Evangelical Reformed, and of course it's the Grace Evangelical Lutheran. And I've not received any nasty calls from the good Christians at that church, so, uh, I, but I did want to correct that. And a rather interesting thing about this photograph, besides the fact that it shows the open towers and all the original uh, work that was done on it, uh, so reminiscent of a French cathedral, down in the front, which can probably barely be seen on camera, the gentleman standing up is Dr. Ellis Kramer, who we've talked about previously. What is interesting about it is that uh, Dr. Kramer was a member of the Reformed Church. In fact, his father had been one of the founders of it, but apparently he just happened to pass by at the time <laughs> that the photograph was taken. You might notice also that the upper stories of the educational building had not been added in, at that time yeah. because that was a, a later addition to the building. Now, uh, we talked about Dr. Goss being the veteran pastor of the Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. The veteran pastor of the uh, Grace Lutheran Church was the Reverend Dr. Charles Edder, whose picture we have. Okay, who comes up next? Here? And Dr. Edder was instrumental in the design of this church. He was sent uh, to Europe by E.J. Young and spent a considerable amount of time studying in the Holy Lands. Mm -hmm. And upon his return, spent two years coming up with the uh, characters that would be portrayed in the stained glass windows that are such a remarkable feature of that church. And in 1935, at the close of the morning worship service, as he was offering the closing prayer, uh, Dr. Edder fell ill. And as he was carried into the adjoining vestibule, and the re his associate pastor, the Reverend Keister, was leading the pra uh, congregation in prayer for his recovery, he died. How dramatic. <sighs> but he was uh, another person in Wadsworth who was a well-known oh, figure for many, many years yeah. because of his 40-year pastorate yeah. at the church. He's left a wonderful legacy, those windows. Are. Yes, they are beautiful. beautiful. In fact, those windows, uh, which were designed by Toll and Wright, um, using Dr. Edder's mm -hmm. guide, mm -hmm. I'd say, in each square foot of window, they contain over 200 pieces of glass, and they're uh, fantastically oh, they intricate and beautiful, and they're said to be one of the most beautiful set of church windows um, in this country, rivaling those of St. John the Divine Cathedral in Washington. Wow. Now, this picture we looked at last time we were together of the Methodist Episcopal Church on Main Street, and we were talking about collectibles or curios, and I said that the Methodist Church didn't seem to put out a whole lot of items that someone like myself who likes to collect these little things would find. But this is one item that is a toothpick holder. And I've actually seen two different varieties of this. 
but uh, it probably won't show up on camera, but depicted on the front of the toothpick holder mm -hmm. is that same church. And for what reason these were made, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, maybe they were favors or something. Either, either a favor or perhaps a fundraising oh, yeah. thing to uh, raise money for some function of the church. Um, if I th I'd like to hold off on this okay. picture for just a moment, please, if we can go on. Sure. I'll just move this off to the side. One of the older congregations in Wadsworth is the First Baptist Church, which is located on Mill Street. And we talked previously with the Catholic Church, which we just saw, being started by many of the people who came to work on the railroad and then stayed over to work in the coal mines, many of these people being of Irish Catholic descent, and they're founding the uh, Sacred Heart Parish. During the time of the uh, coal barons in Wadsworth, uh, strikes developed. And in order to break these strikes, the coal barons brought up railroad cars full of former slaves from Virginia to act as strike breakers. And many of these people came with promises of good jobs and a secure mm -hmm. future, unaware that they were being brought in as strike breakers. And once they arrived here, many of these former slaves returned down south. However, those who stayed were housed in a stockade in the Silver Creek area and uh, worked there until the conclusion of the strike. And within this stockade, they had uh, the different things that would be necessary for them to sustain life. And one of these things that was so important to their faith was the church. And they organized a small church out in that area. Once the strike had ended and the miners, the regular miners, returned back to work, many of these former slaves migrated into the downtown area of Wadsworth and were housed in a large boarding house type building on the north side of College Street and went to work in different mm -hmm. um, homes within Wadsworth as servants or clerking in stores or, or different jobs. But they desired to continue this church that they had started. And so in 1880, the Rous Rising Mount Zion Baptist Church was founded. And through the donations of many people in the community and with the assistance of some of the other denominations, they built this small building on Mill Street, which is actually now the center or the central portion of their enlarged and modernized church edifice. And they were just preparing for their anniversary, for the arrival of their new pastor, the Reverend Rufus Thompson, in 1988, when a fire broke out in the church and destroyed uh, part of the sanctuary and caused extensive damage. But with the same type of faith that sustained them through a hundred years and more, they rallied and, with terrific community support, were able to uh, rebuild their church. But still, this first little frame building. Uh, forms the nucleus of the large modern building that they have now. Mm. That's an interesting story, David. Okay. Okay. Now, we talked before of some of the little uh, collectibles that you might find, and this is a tribute to the uh, Father James Downey, who was leaving the Sacred Heart Congregation in 1945. And we've talked before about uh, Joseph Bender, who was the owner of the Wadsworth Opera House and was an entrepreneur in Wadsworth, and he was also a local poet. And he wrote quite a few poems for different occasions, and this is one, uh, yeah, being a member good. of that parish, that he wrote in honor of uh, Father Downey's leaving the Wadsworth Parish. The first line is, Father, I just came in to say goodbye. This news has crushed my heart. Joe Bender was a wonderful person and a, a philanthropist and was recognized both within his congregation and without. But some of his poems, are, they, I guess they've become a curiosity with age. And one of his was uh, Captain E.J. Young, in which he starts E.J. Young, the industrialist, out as a private, working in his study on uh, Maple Avenue, and then going up through the ranks. And then finally, uh, he is the captain of industry, but he still sits in E.J. Young. <laughs> Don't find poems like that too much anymore. No. This is one, a little brochure that was put out at the time of the uh, dedication of the newest edition to the first Christian church, Disciples of Christ. And it gives a little bit about their history, and it's kind of an updating of their... Yeah, uh, I'll kind of just open it up to see. Yeah. An updating of their congregation, mm -hmm. and also uh, details the windows of their church. Oh. It's beautiful windows, too. Yes. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful church. 
And this is a program, the Services of Dedication, for the New Jerusalem Evangelical Lutheran Church, or what most of us would refer to as the Acme Lutheran. And they had their original building off to the side here, but then they built a new, enlarged, and modern building in 1950s. And this was their program of dedication. These programs are quite uh, interesting, I'm sure, to you, because you can double check a lot of... Well, there's, a, there's a lot of information mm -hmm. that's put in there that of necessity doesn't normally appear in a published history. Do you try to get um, updates of different directories and uh, historical information from the churches? I try to as possible, and some are very forthcoming and cooperative, and some have no desire oh. to participate at all. Uh, now, the Acme Lutheran Church has been very kind in responding with a wealth of information and booklets mm -hmm. and souvenir programs that I did not previously have, and uh, so I certainly thank them for that. The um, Methodist Church, of which I'm a member, bought new hymnals in the 1930s, and they were good enough until the 1960s. <laughs> well, now it's decided that they needed uh, new hymn books, and so these have just recently been purchased, and this is a little dedication program uh, for the service of dedication for those new hymnals and listing the names of the donors and, oh, and so forth. Yeah. And we have, the way the Methodist Church is organized, we have an annual conference that is for the area or the region. And then they, every four years they have what is called a quadrennium, where all of the Methodist churches in the world, the leaders of them, come together and decide on important issues of doctrine and, and social consciousness. And one of the things they decided once was that we were no longer going to call our songbook the Methodist hymnal. We were going to call it the Book of Hymns. Now, if you ask anyone what's a hymnal, they'll say, what's the Book of Hymns? Now, I don't know what their reason was for changing this, but we, we still call it the Methodist hymnal. <laughs> And defined. Huh? If we could do uh, this one first, thank okay. you. Okay. Now, when we were last together, we looked at this book, which is the second volume of uh, History of the Methodist Church of Wadsworth, written by Marion Kuntz Hinkle. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, as we said, provides a wealth of information. But this is one of. I mean, it's kind of. It, wow. And this, this is, is the second plan. volume. Her first volume went up to uh, 1903 when the second church mm -hmm. building was built. And then this brings it mm -hmm. up to date. Yeah. But this book, and as far as I know, that's the only copy that exists, is the yearbook and history of the Methodist Episcopal Church of Wadsworth in 1889. And I've advertised literally around the world to try and find a copy of it. And this is the only one I have, and as you can see, it's falling to pieces. It contains a very complete history of the River Sticks Church, the uh, Sharon Church, the Southwest Sharon Church, Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the first 16 pages of the booklet, which deal with the history of the local Wadsworth Church, written at a time when there were still people around who had lived that history, are missing. And what I suspicion happened was that at some point, someone said, gee, do you have some information we can use? And someone ripped out the pages and said, here you go, and this is what's left. But I'm still trying to find a, another copy of that uh, history. Now, uh, more recently, perhaps in the last 15, 20 years, churches have begun publishing photo directories mm -hmm. yeah. that not only list the name and addresses of the different members of their congregation, but also pictures of the family, which helps you, particularly in the larger churches, to recognize people that you may not be well acquainted with. And it also makes a very nice record of the life of the congregation. This is one from the Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church, and pictured as the rose window above the uh, choir loft there, and it's uh, filled with yeah. the pictures. pictures. Uh, showing the different activities in the life of the denomination as well as members of the uh, pictures of the parishioners. Well, this will help future historians. Exactly, exactly. in identifying pictures. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is one that we mentioned, uh, the Acme Lutheran or Jerusalem Evangelical Lutheran Church. That's the same yeah. type of thing. Mm -hmm. Photograph of the interior and the congregation. Mm -hmm. And this is the most recent one of our Methodist Church, which just came out a few months ago. Yeah, you know, sometimes if you're in a congregation that hasn't updated their book, you look around and you can't identify <laughs> the current hairdo, perhaps, with a, a photograph that's about five years old. And this is one of the first Christian churches, their 1988 directory. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact that they're updating their directory also. So. 
Now, the, I, for some reason, I neglected to bring along the uh, one from Trinity Church, but they use a loose leaf or ring binder format mm -hmm. so that pictures can be taken out and, and new inserts put in so that it can be up okay. to date. Ooh. Now, we talked a moment ago about the... Uh, Shall I if you want to yeah. show that, the one I snatched away from you, <laughs> of the Sacred Heart Parish. We mentioned that being essentially founded by the coal miners of Irish descent, and they were later supplemented by the arrival of European immigrants who came to work for the Ohio companies, uh, the uh, Italians and other denominations that were of the Catholic faith. And in 1929, uh, they replaced their mission church that had been built in 1886 with this brick structure on the same site. Now in 1927, uh, the Reverend Father Carl Anthony accepted the call to come to Wadsworth as pastor of that uh, parish, and it was under his guidance that this mm -hmm. uh, church was built. Now, uh, Father Anthony uh, left, retired because of ill health in 1939, and was replaced by the Reverend Father Downey, whose uh, tribute Joe Bender wrote on that occasion. And this is a history that was put out when the uh, Sacred Heart Congregation celebrated their 50th anniversary in 1936. Oh. And it gives a history of the congregation and uh, awesome. lots of advertisements from <laughs> well-wishers in the community. Pictures here. Yeah, there's a, there's a picture. Same type of picture that we mm -hmm, just saw. Mm -hmm. This is rather interesting. It shows the uh, exterior of the mission church that we've seen before, but there's also a picture of the interior. I don't know how oh. clearly that will come up on camera, but... Uh, was this compiled by um, some of the members there, or was there a specific office? I, I would assume they probably had a committee. It just says, yeah, historical sketches. Yeah, starting off with the Pope. How are we doing on time? I think we're doing fine. All right. Uh, well, we will, we will come back to that in just a moment. But uh, May is the month for Memorial Day. We didn't have the opportunity to get down to the cemetery as we had planned right. beforehand, but, but we people can still are. Do it. We can do that later in the summer, and people are busily down there decorating mm -hmm. the graves of loved ones. Uh, in the last few weeks, I found many people down there who are searching for long lost relatives that they don't remember quite where some relation had been buried and, and trying to find the graves. Unfortunately, these people usually come from out of town on the weekends because it's their free time, and the cemetery office is closed, so there's not always someone there who's able to assist them. Something I w we mentioned last October when we visited the cemetery, and I'd like to stress again, that as I am down there, I see a large number of people jogging through the cemetery, walking dogs and allowing the dogs to relieve themselves on graves and shrubbery and trees, uh, people riding bicycles through the cemetery with no particular purpose in mind, those who uh, try to use the cemetery as a shortcut between Beck Street and West Street, and become rather angry and uh, vocal when they find that there's a gate up that causes them to detour. And these people should be reminded that all of these activities are prohibited. Certainly everyone is welcome to visit the cemetery. Uh, it's not necessary to have a, a relative or a friend there. You can find it a quiet place to meditate or perhaps study a little bit of history. But these other type of activities are really not desirable in a, a place uh, where 10,500 people and more mm -hmm. lay at rest. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that they would respect uh, the solemnity of the area and also the feelings of those who do have friends and relatives there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is for Memorial Day. We will have our Memorial Day parade on Monday, which has always been a tradition in Wandsworth. And in this photograph from 1913, we see J.D. Reimer, who uh, was a veteran of the Civil War and was Grand Marshal of the parade for many, many years, often on Dr. M.F. Miller's $1,500 riding horse. I always <laughs> threw the $1,500 in there. I, I, I guess that was an indication it was a good horse. And in this photograph, he's being assisted by his grandson, Frank L. Reimer, uh, as his adjutant. Frank Reimer would be a veteran of the First World War and later purchasing agent of the Ohio Salt Company and uh, died uh, had an untimely death as a result of an accident in 1939. But uh, both J.D. Reimer and his son Frank, the father of young Frank, 
were butchers who operated a, a landmark butcher shop in the area that's now uh, Love's Country Market. Uh, the young Frank is the father of William Reimer. Mm -hmm. Bill Reimer is the uh, retired president of the Huntington First National Bank, mm -hmm. Wadsworth, who of course is known to many people here. But uh, hopefully a lot of people will turn out for the Memorial Day Parade. It's kind of interesting to me, I've noticed the last few years that it seems like the majority of the people who attend the Memorial Day Parade are what you might say newcomers to town, the younger families who take their children. And especially since the Persian Gulf activities, um, it's interesting to me when I would walk down to the Memorial Day Parade from my house, located by the high school, to downtown, I'd be lucky if I passed five or six flags. But now suddenly everyone's yeah. decided they want to increase the economy of Taiwan and have run out and bought flags <laughs> and their decals and buttons and Lord knows where the profits for these things go in many cases. But uh, while I think it's wonderful to have this pride for our country and this enthusiasm for our um, servicemen and women, I hope that it's not just a fad. And I hope that people will remember that there are a lot of veterans from previous wars uh, both living and dead, many of them living in veterans' hospitals or who have other problems. And I would hope that we can continue to remember all of these people and not just the fine men and women who served us in the Gulf. Also, we're coming up on graduation. Boy, we're going to have to talk faster, aren't we? <laughs> we can always continue this, you know. Well, we can see how far we'll get. Okay. But we're coming up on graduation. Um, we have some examples here. This is a... Uh, the now this isn't sheepskin. I've, in fact, I have, <laughs> I have one at home that is sheepskin, and I didn't bring that. I should have. Take this Something out of else. your way. Just a oh, piece of. Another one here. Oh, let's see. It's almost like Christmas. I tell you, this is a Wadsworth High School diploma, and this one was uh, presented to Marguerite Kramer, who was later Mrs. Oh. Dave Straton Jr. That we've talked we've talked about her before. She is the daughter of Dr. Ellis Kramer that we saw in front of the uh, Grace Lutheran Church. And uh, she was graduated from Wadsworth High School in 1912 and went on to teach uh, sixth, gr sixth grade at Franklin School for a while previous to her marriage. But this was the diploma that she received at that time with the signatures of the officials. Frank Lytle, who was the superintendent and later went on to be a state representative. A.J. Crable, who was the principal and then would become the cashier of the First National Bank. And C.B. Allen, who was the uh, chief engineer of the Ohio Injector con uh, Company and C.E. Holden, who was with a uh, former mayor of Wadsworth, who was the clerk of the Board of Education. Receiving a diploma this size, you know you've graduated. Well, I guess. <laughs> it, it's a little hard to hide. Now, as time passed, yes. uh, the diplomas got a little more practical. <laughs> and uh, this is one from the 1940s. Oh. Fact. And uh, this one happened to be my father's diploma. And again, had the signatures of the superintendent, Morris uh, Burkholder, and O.J. Work, and I can't see in the glare all the other people, but in any case, uh, the people who at that time were members of the Board of Education. And, oh, one thing well, we might point out. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I had my finger over it. And uh, up at the top, they have what we would now call Central Middle School because, of course, that was the high school at that time, back in the olden days. And things got a little more... A little more compact by the time I came along. <laughs> I assume this is probably fairly similar to the ones that I've never seen one up close that they're handing out I don't know. this year. But you notice again they have the high school uh, over here, but it would look much different because many of the areas that are now classrooms mm -hmm. and uh, social areas had not been built or, or extended back in the olden days when I was here. They still have the red cover though. Those have almost always been the Wadsworth colors. Uh, occasionally, they've tried to go into other directions, but those have been the ones that okay. most... Uh, okay. We can just go through these real quickly. This is an invitation to the 14th annual commencement for the Wadsworth High School uh, in 1892 when the graduation exercises were held at the Armory. The first graduation exercises were held in what was called Pfeiffer Hall, which would be the upstairs of the... Uh, title Bureau downtown, what is now the American Legion Social Room, and then they were moved to the Armory after it was built, and they continued there until the uh, Opera House was built in 1895. So beginning with 1896, they were held there until 1923, <laughs> when the uh, addition was built to the uh, junior high, well, now the junior high school, the O.J. Work Auditorium. This is a picture of the class. Uh, you don't have to go this fast. We will continue next, <laughs> next time. Oh, I want to get our film in. This is a 
the class of 1892 with F.M. Planck in the center. And I have two copies of it, and the one copy that I'm holding tells me that it was taken on Monday, April 27, 1891, for the class of 1892, and it lists all the names of the class, but they're not in order. Now, why anyone would go to the trouble to list all the names and not put them in an order that makes any sense, uh, the copy of the one you're holding uh, is from the J.B. Hilliard collection, and he has written on it, Wadsworth High, Year One. Well, that's not the first year no, Wadsworth High. Yeah. So I, I've got a feeling he was starting to write something else and either had to check something or got interrupted, and it was never completed. So consequently, I don't know what... Who's who? But yeah. it is the class of 1892. Okay. Jumping after the turn of the century, this is the class of 1919. And now we might first think that that would be the O.J. Work Auditorium, the stage where they're posing, but we know that that was not built until 1922, so this was taken in the Opera House, on the stage uh -huh. of the Opera House. And they have the shield that's so familiar to us as one of the symbols of the uh, Wadsworth High School. And the women all dressed alike, and the men all in their dark suits. I mentioned the Opera House with someone and they I'm sure it never happened, but I know it did. Good for you. <laughs> this is the program for the uh, 43rd annual commencement, which was the class of 1919. And you see here now it says it's at the Opera House. Their class flower was the blue violet, and their class motto is loyalty and everything. I read the class motto this year, and they seem to get longer and longer and longer. And I keep charts of these, and I've gotten to the point now where the last five or ten years, I have to go on to another page because they're too long to get all of these quotes in there. Not a quick sentence, huh? This is also the class of 1919 that we just saw, yeah. and I, I pointed this out to you a few moments ago. Um, this is the actual invitation. What we just looked at was the program. This is the invitation. But I, the style of writing was unusual. Right. Yeah, it looked kind of oriental. It does, and I don't know what the reason is why they chose that particularly. Um, but that, in any case, was the... Uh, invitation for that year. This is the kind of books that you keep your information in? No, actually this one just came to me just this just way happened. and rather than tear it apart, it's a, it's a commencement memory book is what it says on the front, and rather than tear it apart or anything I thought I'd just leave it as I received it. Okay. Now the, um, this is the yearbook we've seen before, The Shield. It's one of the times when the name of the yearbook was changed. It was the Whisperer, and then the next That's class right, yeah. decided it was going to be the Anvil. Then they changed it to the Shield, and then they went back to Whisperer. But this is the yearbook for that class. And the uh, yearbook was published by the junior class uh, every year and uh, for, the, for the ensuing year. Okay. Now this book is Wadsworth Center to City, which is the work of the class of 1938, probably one of the most active classes that we have. Uh, as far as alumni is concerned. It started as a class project. We've talked about it before. They gathered so much information that it was decided to publish it into a book, which was underwritten by Nellie Harder, the owner of the Banner Press newspaper. And they published this book, of which they are justly proud. And they still hold their reunions on a regular basis. This is uh, their commencement program. They started to take a different form by then. And that's for the class of 1938, okay. listing the class role in the program. Okay. And their yearbook. Now, the, the, one of the reasons that they decided to do uh, the book or that that assignment was assigned to them by Eleanor Shapiro was the fact that uh, 1938 represented the 150th anniversary of the Northwest Ordinance, which settled our area of the country. And the Northwest Ordinance, as we can see by opening this, uh -huh. was used as a theme for their uh, Northwest Territory, I should say, was used as a theme for their yearbook, and that's one of the things that fostered the idea of doing the Wadsworth Center to City History Book. So history actually was alive. And this is one of their this is their golden anniversary uni reunion in 1988, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and these books are particularly important to me because they list the members of the class and where they live currently, and this is important for the many people who have either retired and moved south or west, or for the uh, female members of the class who are married and their married ma names may not be known to me. And you notice over the, the little tag there yeah. inside, they're called the Center to City Kids. <laughs> kids at heart right now. And they are, as I say, one of our most active mm -hmm. alumni groups. Mm -hmm. Is that all the information on that particular class? Yes. Okay, because we need to break right now if we want to get the film clip done. Can all right. Give us a little background first? Yes, we will. Uh, we have a film that is uh, coming to us again from 
the collection of Dr. Earl Melvin, who was the father-in-law of the late Dr. Daniels. And this film uh, shows the parade coming up. We showed a program earlier, the 50th anniversary of the Sacred Heart of Jesus Catholic Church in Wadsworth. This, this is a parade showing the dignitaries, Bishop Schrems and the other officials being led by the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of Columbus in Wadsworth, which is called the Father Anthony Council, in honor of Father Anthony, who was pastor of the church at the time it was built. Yeah, I've got to get that in there. Uh, Father uh, An uh, Anthony Council was formed in 1949. They bought, uh, and uh, so this group of Knights of Columbus would have been probably from Barberton, but different officials going into the church. Then you'll see some people coming out of Sunday morning service from the Grace Evangelical mm -hmm. Lutheran Church, the Trinity Evangelical and Reformed Church, and lastly, the First Methodist Episcopal Church, and there's more of them than any others because Dr. Melvin was a Methodist. <laughs> so we can take a look at that right now. Okay, before we do that, I want to say thank you for watching, and David, you've kind of given us a preview of what's coming up next. Thank you for coming. Hopefully we'll have a lot more things to, to talk about by then. Okay.